Thank you all so much for tuning in. Today's discussion is Precision Medicine Ethics, Navigating Genetic Screening with Care. Our agenda for the conversation today, we'll do a quick round of introductions, speaker presentations, um, some discussion, and then I will do a round robin with cl some closing thoughts. So on the call today, uh, there's me. I'm Lindsay Wallstrom Edwards. I'm the partnership lead for Sano Genetics. Um, Erica, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Erica Barnes. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Rare Disease Advisory Council. We're an executive branch state agency and our main um, objective is to advise the state and the different state programs for how to improve care for the rare disease community. Thank you. Christine. Sure. Hi, I'm Christine Von Reisfeld. I'm a patient advocate. I work with multiple organizations and nonprofits really just trying to advance the patient voice. Just recently, I joined the newborn screening, what was it, the <laughs> Begin NGS Consortium. And so happy to keep talking about these things that are so important. Thank you. Molly. Yes, hello, I'm Molly McGinnis. I'm a genetic counselor and the senior director of advisory services at Genome Medical. Um, Genome Medical is a virtual medical practice that specializes in genetics and genomics. So we offer access to genetic counseling, genetic test ordering, MD services in all 50 states and Canada. Um, and we were really formed to help solve the access gap um, for patients to get access to genetic counseling. Thank you so much. And Jean. Hi, I'm Jean Swidler, Executive Director for Genetic ALS and FTD and The Legacy. We're a patient advocacy group focused on the individuals impacted by inherited uh, ALS and frontal temporal dementia. And uh, my family has been uh, very impacted by that late, later in life uh, onset disease. And uh, I myself am an, am an asymptomatic carrier for an ALS and FTD related genetic mutation. Thank you so much. It's so nice to have you all here and I look forward to our conversation today. To get us started, I just wanna give a little bit of background, background to the conversation. Uh, so a high level overview of genetic testing programs. First and foremost, what is genetic testing? Genetic testing looks for changes in your genetic makeup. So we call those mutations or variants that happen in your DNA. So it, your DNA has nucleotides, which code for amino acids that lead to proteins. I threw a lot of big words in there, but the key word is to think about the proteins because proteins govern how your body functions in many different ways. So when we have changes to those proteins, those can lead to dysfunction of varying degrees. So some can be minor and some can be pretty significant disease. Um, and so when we are looking at uh, genetic testing, uh, we have four types of primary genetic testing, single gene. So that looks at one specific gene. So APOE4, for example, is something that's been associated to Alzheimer's disease. We'd be looking in changes uh, or very specific variants of the APOE4 gene. A gene panel or an array sometimes looks at a variance for a predetermined number of genes. So that could be anything from two to three to hundreds for a condition. A newborn screen is actually a really good example of an array. And then we have whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing. Whole exome sequencing looks at about one to 2% of the genome. It looks at, at little pieces of it called SNPs. Um, it's really good for testing for known variants and diseases. Whole genome sequencing looks at the genome in its entirety. Uh, it's really good for looking at different conditions. One of, one of the ones that Jean mentioned um, actually is not about the presence or absence of a specific variant, but the number of times that variant is, is present or the gene is present. Um, and it also is really good when we don't know exactly what we're looking for. We might need to examine the whole genome in order to see where, where things are happening to, in order to get to a diagnosis. We'll get into more specifics later. The main types of genetic testing programs that are relevant for today's conversation are things like carrier and prenatal testing. So carrier testing is when we look for, uh, if we possess a specific gene or variant, um, often with the, in, with the intent of understanding whether or not we may pass that off to our children. Prenatal testing, obviously, is we're looking at the presence or absence of mutations in, the, in anticipation of a child being conceived or born. Um, predictive testing, something that, that Jean has referred to, is understanding our risk for a specific condition. So taking a test in advance of the onset of symptoms so that we can understand uh, our risk, what our risk might be. So a very good example is BRCA. We hear a lot of people talking about undergoing testing for BRCA, understanding what their options might be in order to prevent or delay the onset of a condition. 
diagnostic testing is testing that's conducted once someone has already developed some symptoms. It helps us get to an actual diagnosis sometimes faster, and also can help us understand what our treatment options may be, what the best course of treatment could be. Pharmacogenomic testing helps us understand if we possess specific genes or proteins that may affect how we process medications. Sometimes we may process it differently and we may not respond to treatment or specific treatments as well if we have the presence or absence of specific genes. And then you might hear about forensic testing. That's what you see on things like CSI. It's not relevant to today's conversation, but I would be remiss not to mention it. So it feels like genetic testing is everywhere right now and everyone's sort of talking about it. Um, direct to consumer market, especially in this country is booming. There are a lot of options out there. So why is that happening? Well, precision medicines are on track to surpass non-personalized medicines in the next five years. Um, precision medicines really are treatments that are tailored to, uh, based on your, your genetic or your biomarker data. So you think about what's happened in oncology. If you know someone who has breast cancer, for example, you've probably heard them talk about if they're triple positive or if they're estrogen receptor positive or progesterone receptor positive, we are providing treatments to individuals based on specific biomarkers or, or, or features of their body or their, or their cancer or their disease so that we can provide more tailored treatments that have better results and outcomes. Um, and with the rise of genomics, we're looking at new technologies like gene therapy, which could be really transformative for healthcare. Um, so I've given a really, really high level. I could spend probably an hour on every single one of these slides, um, but I just wanna make sure that everyone has some basic understanding so that the real experts on this call can take over. So with that said, I'm gonna pass it over to Molly, who's gonna give us a little bit more context about her work. Wonderful. Thanks, Lindsay. I thought you did a great job of, of really describing all of the myriad of testing options and the explosion of genetic testing that's happening right now, just not just for diagnosis, but also for therapeutic development and treatment opportunities. Um, oftentimes when people hear the word genetic testing, they think about genetic counseling or it's kind of comes together in one sentence. So I want to provide a little bit of a foundation of kind of what genetic counseling is and how this can really help support patients, families, and communities, and really navigating this new diagnostic testing landscape. Um, when we talk about genetic counseling, it's really the process of talking to individuals and families to help them understand the impact um, of genetics on themselves, their family, um, and what this means for them and risk for other family members. And oftentimes when we're talking about genetic counseling, um, we're talking about genetic counselors. Um, most often genetic counselors are the healthcare profession um, professionals that are performing genetic counseling. But I, I do want to say that there's a lot of healthcare providers that are out there that are doing genetic counseling, right? Talking to families about their risk um, and interpreting genetic test results. Um, but genetic counselors, just like myself, um, have master's degree level training in genetics and counseling. Um, there are 56, um, as we speak, um, certified um, graduate programs right now in the U.S. Um, and once people graduate, they're eligible to take their board exams, which then makes them eligible to be licensed in various states. Um, and for genetic counselors, you know, during the training, they're really trained to leave graduate school and feel really comfortable in practicing in a multiple, multiple different settings. So anywhere from reproductive counseling, pediatric, oncology, and then subspecialties. And when you think about genetic counseling, most of the time you are thinking about um, clinically counseling with patients. Um, so these are counselors who work in like an academic medical center or a private practice. Um, but there are a lot of genetic counselors now 30% of the field actually practice practices in non-patient facing roles. Um, I think which is really critical, right? They're working in the laboratories, helping develop tests. Um, they're working in public health and also pharmaceutical, you know, pharmaceutical companies in terms of development. And we'll go to the next slide. So what do genetic counselors actually do? Like I mentioned, um, they really provide a level of interpretation of medical and family history. So really look at a patient's personal history and family history and say, what's the risk of a genetic condition? They educate. So they talk to patients about what genetic tests may be appropriate for them. What are the pros, the cons, what to expect? 
Um, and then they also really promote informed decision making. So I will say a central tenet of genetic counseling is patient autonomy, empowering patients to get the right information, to make the right decision with them. It may mean genetic testing. It may not mean genetic testing. Um, and then lastly, it's not about just the genetic test. Um, it's about supporting patients with resources. So regardless of if they have testing or they have a known mutation um, that was identified in a test for themselves or their family members, it's really linking them to the right providers, patient advocacy organizations, and care recommendations. Um, so I have a really lovely quote on the right-hand side. This is actually from a patient who saw a genetic counselor at our company. And I really love this quote because I love the word empowered. Like she felt empowered because of the recommendations that her counselor gave her. Um, and I think this is really important. Um, you know, one of the, I think, most exciting areas of our field right now is really looking at patient outcomes related to genetic counseling. So there's some great literature in the last five to 10 years that is really showing that when a patient has access to genetic counseling, um, they may actually um, have lower psychological distress, lower anxiety, better informed about um, a genetic condition. Also, they may be more empowered to move forward with management recommendations. And these are the types of outcomes I think that are really critical to helping our profession grow. If we can actually show positive um, patient outcomes. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, you know, I'll make a little pivot here as well, because I think another area that's really exciting about our field is, you know, the last 10 to 15 years, like Lindsay mentioned, this explosion of genetic testing, um, especially within the diagnostic field, um, has really shifted this paradigm. It went it's in our field of just finding a diagnosis for a patient ending that di diagnostic odyssey, letting them have an answer. And when I graduated in my, my graduate program in 2009, there wasn't a lot of conditions where there was treatments or cures for these conditions. It was a lot of management recommendations and kind of what to expect. But now this field has really shifted. And when we just think about gene therapies that have come on the market in the last five years, we really look at conditions where there was an extreme unmet need. So hemophilia, um, Libra's congenital amaurosis, which is a um, retinal disorder, um, beta thalassemia, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Again, conditions where there was absolutely no treatment. And this has really changed the motivation for a lot of patients and families about why they want access to genetic testing now and why they may be coming back to see a genetic counselor because there's opportunities for them to either have an on-market therapeutic or be eligible for a clinical trial. And we'll shift to the last slide. Um, and I, I will say, I'll kind of end on this before we move over, but you know, this explosion of not just diagnostic testing that's available for patients, but like Lindsay mentioned, um, direct-to-consumer testing, it's really shifted the questions that genetic counselors are often fielding on a day-to-day -day basis. So I asked some of our clinical counselors kind of what are the types of questions that they typically get. On the left-hand side, I think you'll see that these are more traditional questions that we're used to talking to patients about. What do the test results mean? What's the chance that this could be passed on? Um, will my insurance cover the cost of testing? Are there treatments? Will this impact health insurance? Um, two, on the right-hand side, I think you can see there's just this increased genomic literacy. So patients coming to us saying, I've had testing, I have my VCF file, can you an analyze my raw data? Um, can you tell me my ancestry? Can you test me for this condition that's multifactorial? So um, I think it's great because patients are coming to us really informed, but it does increase, I think, the complexity of um, questions and discussions that our genetic counseling team is navigating. So I'll kind of end there, and I'd love to hear from the rest of the group before we jump into discussion. Fantastic. Erica, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Lindsay, and thanks, Molly. Um, I, I love the way you all sort of set the, the table and set the stage for kind of talking through some of the advances that we've had in precision medicine and, and um, genetics. What I want to do now is dive a little bit into how that relates to newborn infant screening as a public health program and what are some of the challenges and some of the ethical considerations that we need to be making. So Lindsay, if you could go to the next slide. 
So the first thing I want to talk about just very briefly is why newborn screening is particularly vital for the rare disease community, which is the community in which we're seeing a lot of these um, gene therapies being developed. Um, you know, when it, with rare diseases, about 50% um, of rare diseases are pediatric in nature, and about 80% of rare diseases are genetic. So particularly genetic testing and newborn screening are, are both very vital to the rare disease community. And the reason, in addition, I've, I've laid out sort of three broad categories uh, uh, to explain why newborn screening is so vital to the community. And the first thing is, um, newborn screening is one of the most effective ways to provide a timely diagnosis for rare diseases. So rare diseases, the average time to diagnosis is about seven to eight years through a traditional diagnostic pathway. Um, so being able to find a way to get to an earlier diagnosis. And uh, one of the reasons for that is very few providers have familiarity with the specific symptoms of rare diseases. So um, trying to expect a general care provider to identify one of the 10,000 rare diseases that are very complex um, by looking at the, the signs and symptoms of a patient, it's not realistic. So we really need to find better ways of diagnosing. And this reduces the diagnostic odyssey. Um, the next um, reason that newborn screening is so vital is a little bit of a paradox. So Lindsay and Molly both reference gene therapy. For uh, quite a few of these gene therapies with these neurodegenerative diseases, there's a paradox where um, in order to diagnose these diseases through a tr traditional pathway, which is look for symptoms, you've got to wait for symptom onset to get that definitive diagnosis. But for these uh, treatments to be effective, you have to diagnose them pre-symptomatically. So the way to solve that paradox is to implement either genetic testing or newborn screening. Um, and then for the next, uh, the next column, the reason that newborn screening is so vital is really being able to get families early support. Um, getting families early support reduces their feelings of isolation and all the trauma related to the diagnostic odyssey. Um, also being able to, to get an early diagnosis and early support allows the patient community to form, which also leads to acceleration of research because you've got a timely diagnosis, you've got a strong patient community, and they can really advocate for more funding for research. Um, they can really provide a unified, uh, unified voice. And then lastly, newborn screening is really vital because it allows for the early diagnosis, which gives a chance for more effective disease management. So when there's a delay in diagnosis, there tends to be an exacerbation of symptoms. And then um, those exacerbation of symptoms leads to poor functional outcomes. So it's very vital to get these kids diagnosed quickly. Next slide. So I wanna go specifically into some of the impacts of the advancements on state newborn screening programs. Um, some of the, some of the um, considerations um, that, that we have to take into account and, and some of the um, opportunities. So first of all, um, some of the advancements in genetic testing, if we can incorporate it into our newborn screening programs, right now um, newborn screening is done biochemically for the first line and then confirmatory testing is, is genetic, but for the, to, to, there's a movement to um, implement um, genetic testing into that first line. So currently there's 37 diseases that are on the RUST, the recommended uniform screening panel. Um, so 37 and adding these diseases is a very slow and arduous process. Whereas if we use genome sequencing, we could screen for hundreds in a single test versus this, you know, adding one by one. Um, so there is a need, there is a need and an opportunity for a more expedited process for adding conditions and for screening. So um, currently the recommended uniform screening panel approves an addition of one condition per year. Um, this is not gonna keep pace as, as Lindy, Lindsay and Molly mentioned, we're having more and more effective treatments come into uh, the rare disease space. So we're not gonna be able to keep pace. We need to find a way to be quicker, more nimble with our, with our screening and identifying children. Um, we're also going to need, uh, we have a need for better processes for follow-up care. So um, rare diseases that requires these highly personalized precision medicine uh, treatments, we're going to need to um, do a better job with our follow-up care. I'm not going to spend much time on that because it's not as pertinent to the discussion. What I really want to get to is the next slide 
to talk a little bit about the ethical considerations. And again, as Lindsay said, I feel like I could spend an hour on each one, but I just want to give an overview and then maybe leave us some time to discuss these. So um, some of the concerns, the ethical and logistical challenges, um, we know that the opportunity to, to incorporate newborn screening, uh, genetic testing into newborn screening is um, it's a fantastic opportunity, but it doesn't come without some challenges and things we have to keep in mind. So the first thing that we're going to have to solve if we're going to be able to do this successfully is we're going to have to talk through data storage and privacy concerns. So every state um, oversees their own newborn screening program. And there are states with just wildly varying degrees of resources. And it's going to take an enormous amount of resources for states to store this data. If you think about it, for collecting um, genetic testing for each baby that's born, that's gonna require a lot of storage and a lot of protection. So there's rightly concerns around privacy. How do we make sure that, that we do that in a way that's ethical so that we're not um, putting people's um, patient data and their, their, their genetic information at risk? There's also some equity concerns that we're gonna need to tackle as a society. So the genome is based largely on white European data, right? And so when we're looking at our diverse patient populations, we see um, a disproportionate amount of things such as our uh, variations of unknown uh, significance. Um, so we really need to make sure that that we're doing and, and there is there are efforts around the country to address this and to make sure that the genetic data that um, that we're um, pulling off of is more diverse. Um, but that's just something we need to to um, keep in mind that it that there's an equity issue when it comes to identifying even the the um, mutated genes and what that actually means. Um, sort of related to that is another ethical consideration is that our ability to diagnose and our ability to identify mutations, right now it's outpacing our ability to treat. So um, many mutations that we can identify and, and many times when we, when we diagnose a patient, patient, information such as onset, right? Um, so we're not sure of when this disease is actually going to present. So we may identify someone, uh, for example, um, um, my daughter actually had a um, genetic disease. And within my community, there's different subsets of onset. So my daughter's disease presented at 14 months, some kids present at nine years, and some people don't present with the disease until adulthood. So we need to think about how we're going to manage that from a clinical perspective and a um, a counseling perspective. Um, in addition to that, we do know that we can identify many, many more diseases than we have effective treatments for. So we need to grapple with what is the value of identifying a disease in the absence of being able to offer an effective treatment. And there's people on you know, multiple sides of, of that uh, um, side of the issue. So those are just some of the challenges. I know I did not do them justice, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna stop my presentation there. But I do just wanna end on a very hopeful note that you know, in the last decade, we've seen such an advance. It's been really breathtaking in our advan uh, advances in the ability to diagnose through the use of genetic testing and our ability to treat through precision medicine. So it's an exciting time. Thank you so much, Erica. I'm gonna pass it over now to Jean. Thank you so much to the prior speakers for laying out so many important things. Um, as a patient advocate, I'm just going to narrow in on uh, a few specific issues related to genetics and policy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so again, I'm from Genetic ALS and FTD and the Legacy, an organization dedicated to the needs and interests of the um, genetic ALS and FTD community. But really, uh, many of the things that are important to us uh, matter for just about everybody who's uh, impacted by um, adult onset inherited uh, diseases, especially neurodegenerative diseases. Um, next slide, please. So uh, I live in California, and uh, California has had very dedicated uh, legislative leadership on ensuring genetic privacy is looked after. And there's uh, tons of legislation working on um, uh, genetic privacy considerations. And if you engage in discussions on genetics, often the, the focus will be on genetic privacy, which um, 
you know, is an important thing. And the scenario in which genetic privacy is um, needed is to prevent um, abuse of genetic information by bad actors. So some nefarious uh, person or, or organization using genetic information against people. Um, but privacy laws do not address empowering people to use their genetics to advance their personal health. Uh, next slide, please. So like we discussed, there's been these big advances in genetic disease management and growing understanding of genetic risks uh, allows for patient communities to be organized, like in our community, and demand and achieve better results uh, for these diseases that uh, in many cases have haunted families for generations. But the fear of discrimination inhibits the use of genetics. Uh, when individuals consider the possibility of using genetics to guide personal medicine and precision medicine, any responsible clinician or any trained genetic counselor will ensure they are warned of possible risks, especially discrimination in insurance products. What's very interesting here is that, um, you know, clinicians are, are talking about these insurance products with people um, when no one really knows if if these uh, financial products make sense for any one person. Um, and for, for some of these things, they make financial sense for very few people. Um, but the, the fact that you could be discriminated against and you know that there is a very uh, material possible downside to this information chills the contemplation of these issues on a personal level. Uh, next slide, please. When we forbid genetic discrimination, people can be empowered to utilize precision medicine and genetics for their own personal health. Let's just, let's just all agree, uh, discrimination based on immutable characteristics is wrong. You're born away, you should not be treated uh, uh, poorly because of the way you were born. So um, that's just a value I think that we can all agree on in, in our society. Um, protecting from discrimination would empower individuals to use genetics without being warned uh, that using genetics could materially harm them. And, uh, you know, th there has been a longstanding federal law, uh, GINA, which uh, with the educated um, viewers of this uh, webinar, you know, people are familiar with this. Uh, it provides uh, protections for employment, um, in, in larger employers above 15 employees and in health insurance, but it does not cover other insurances. Next slide, please. M expanded genetic non-discrimination protections are possible. Uh, Florida, for instance, passed a very expansive genetic non-discrimination law in 2020 and is the law in Florida right now. Um, no dramatic change in insurance practices has occurred. Um, the, the insurers did not leave the state. People are still buying life insurance, long-term care insurance, disability insurance in, in Florida, even after these um, protections were put in place. Now, an interesting confounding factor that I think it's important for everyone to understand, um, will family history of disease as well as genetic testing itself be protected in these laws? GINA does cover family history, uh, but the expanded protections in Florida do not cover family history, just genetic uh, results. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just to pivot to uh, one other area where I think policy uh, should be considered. Um, Genetics and inheritance of traits from relatives were really first uh, applied in humans in the uh, study and the advancement of eugenics, you know, like a hundred years ago or so. And the specter that we could use genetic information to improve humanity by getting rid of undesirables is always, um, a specter in genetics, um, or 
unfairly controlling people or unfairly uh, using state power or other power to restrict the rights of people based on their genetics is something that we have to be very careful about. Unfortunately, government uh, funded research initiatives um, have not been required to be accountable to the genetic groups they are studying. And often um, government sponsored research could be putting in place things that gen uh, people impacted by certain genetic conditions just would not like um, to be researched into as it doesn't help them in any way. So we should ensure that uh, genetic research is always uh, rooted in the needs of the communities um, that the genetic research is about and that our communities can always feel that our interests are being considered. Thank you so much and I'll pass it, pass it on. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jane, I really appreciate that. Okay, Christine, and I'm actually gonna pull down the slides at this point, so, so feel free to jump in. Yeah. Can you hear me and see me okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. So I am going to take more of a personal approach to all of this and share with you guys a little bit about my own journey with genomics and precision and personalized medicine. So as someone who has spent years, 49 years to be exact, undiagnosed, I understand the impact that access to genomic data can have on finding a true diagnosis and guiding my treatment decisions. Years ago, I had access to a pharmacogenomics test, and a few years prior, I had been experiencing a lot of different symptoms which were dismissed as symptoms of progression of my disease. What it actually was was damage from the medications that I was taking. So the three standard of care drugs that were used to treat one of my supposed conditions were actually causing more damage than the disease itself. And through that pharmacogenomics test, we were able to determine that I was a slow metabolizer on certain medications and fast on others. But my journey didn't start there. It, start at, it started at a very young age with a series of just unexplained symptoms that have just left me undiagnosed and living with multiple chronic conditions and disabilities, I faced numerous challenges in trying to find the right diagnoses and treatment. It wasn't until I had access or started to have access to genomic data that we were started to look at uncovering potentially the underlying causes of some of my health issues. So I've been working with a group called Research to the People. We're actively working towards my own diagnoses, including having my parents genetically sequenced for their help in building information. But this effort has been joined by my doctor and has been instrumental in exploring the genetic data and trying to find answers that my coordinated care team can put into play. But I wanna say that when we talk about precision medicine, we also have to talk about the data. We can't have precision or personalized medicine without more data. And I think there are a lot of issues that we have to consider. So ethical issues like privacy, informed consent, and equitable distribution of benefits and risks. So I think as we navigate the complexity of genetic screening, it's crucial to address these concerns to ensure that all patients can benefit from advancements in precision medicine. So one of the biggest challenges in advancing precision medicine is incentivizing patient participation, especially for those who are concerned about data security and privacy and even the profitability of their information. So to address these concerns, I think we need to advance the data security and implement security measures to protect patient data and ensure privacy. We have to promote transparency and provide clear information about how data will be used and the benefits of participation, and maybe even offer some financial incentives and compensate patients for their participation in research studies. But we also, at this same time, need to educate our patients and inform them about the importance of their contribution to medical research and the potential benefits for our future treatments, but also discussing those negatives. When patients have access to health data, it can significantly accelerate the process of precision medicine. By enabling secure and decentralized data sharing, we can create a more comprehensive and accurate picture of 
patient health. This view will allow for better research, more precision treatment plans, and ultimately improved patient outcomes. And empowering us with our data doesn't only do that, it also fosters trust and encourages active participation in the healthcare journey. And it's crucial for that to be successful in any type of precision medicine. So in conclusion, my journey has shown me the transformative power of genomic data and working towards a true diagnosis and guiding my own treatment decisions and even the medications we take. So as we continue to advance precision medicine, I think it's essential to navigate the ethical considerations with care and to ensure that all of the patients have access to the benefits of personalized medicine. And I'll end it there. Thank you so much, Christine. And I know you're actually lobbying uh, right now in DC, <laughs> I am in DC. A, <laughs> taking a break outside of Capitol Hill to come have this conversation with us today. So I, I want to pull on a thread that was pretty consistent across everyone's presentation today. Um, unsurprising because we were talking about ethics, um, but everyone had a little bit of a different slant on it. So when we talk about um, genetics, we talk about the data, I'd love to do uh, have a little conversation on some of the ethical considerations around data ownership, um, as well as individuals' access to their own genetic information in the ab in the in the absence of a Molly or someone who can uh, give some context to what the data is saying. Um, so I guess I'll open it up if there are any initial thoughts or reactions to that theme. If we need me to to get into a more succinct question, I'm happy to do that too. Can I say one thing in working with like the Light Collective? It's an organization fighting for patient digital rights and on the health for safety today. But one of the words that we hate to use when regards to data is ownership. And I think that ownership for us implies something that you can have, but then you can also sell off. And we want to make sure that when we're talking about a person's data, it's not something that they can sell off, right? I, I always use the analogy that my data is my song. And if you want to play my music, there's royalties to be paid. So kind of thinking along that line. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's great. I mean, when we talk about ownership, I think people often speak about owning your own data, uh, but you're right. Sometimes organizations will own data um, and the, the royalty, the song and royalties analogy is it's a, it's an interesting one. Are there any reactions to Christine's comment or other additions to the topic? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. I, I think that was a really, really powerful statement, Christine. And I would say, you know, in terms of newborn screening, it's, it's even more of a consideration, right? Because when you're screening, um, these are, these are opt out programs often, right? So when you, when you're doing a newborn screening, people, people aren't necessarily thinking through or aware that their data, their child's data is being collected. So it requires even more of a, of a responsibility um, and it, it becomes even more important. And I think constantly as I advocate for innovations to newborn screening, I'm constantly reminding myself that this is a public health program, right? And it, it affects everyone. So we have to be so careful um, with, with those considerations when we're collecting data that we've agreed to societally collect, but perhaps individuals um, um, have have concerns, and so taking those seriously um, and just making sure that we're we're extra careful. Just to uh, jump in, um, everyone uh, deserves the right to pursue their healthcare as uh, they see fit. And um, we should not um, withhold precision medicine from people because of uh, what if scenarios, um, and especially if people undergo genetic counseling and are making informed consent choices. I know that's a little different for pediatric screening, but um, you know those are for you know there's guidelines around what programs are included in pediatric screening, so they're not uh, adult onset diseases. So um, just some. Just some other flavors. Molly, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I'll just add, I think even just hearing the perspectives on this call, right, show that everyone has a slightly different kind of slant on how they think about 
data ownership right to that information, what they choose to do with it or not. And I'll, I'll just say certainly from the genetic counseling perspective, you know, we're seeing that with patients and communities as well, right? Patients are asking more information of, okay, great. I have this genetic test result. It was negative. Um, do I have access to the raw data from the laboratory? Or what are they doing with this information? I see this line in their consent form. And so I think it really is showing our community, right, that we have to be able to answer those questions and then support patients um, and provide them some guidance, right? It's not our job as a genetic counseling community need to tell patients what to do or not do with that information, but at least provide some guide rails on, um, here's maybe what to think about if you're looking this up, or you can come back to me um, and being able to kind of provide that that source of guidance for patients. But I think, again, even in this, this group, you see the different levels of perspectives and our community is getting asked those questions every day. And it's about being able to guide those patients of, yes, you can call the lab yourself and you can get access to this or call me back, right? in a year and I can re-look at this data and see if there's any changes maybe to this view of has this been reinterpreted. It's a changing landscape, right? And there's we're all still trying to kind of catch up essentially. And I think that's how the genetic counseling field is, is as well, right? The technology is moving really fast and we're just trying to do the best we can to make sure we're kind of arming patients with information and able to guide them. Great. I think that that's an interesting segue actually to another question that I had, which is if we are arming patients, I know Erica and I both have had the experience of caring for a child and needing to undergo, uh, having a child undergo testing and making decisions on behalf of someone else. And that can happen too with conditions where there's cognitive impairment associated. And so I, I wonder w where the group stands really, or if there are set guidelines as to how do we accurately, uh, can, or, appropriately, I should say, consent individuals in the context of we have newborns who are undergoing testing, who are having their genetic information um, taken for treatment purposes or preventative purposes. Um, and, and how do we how do we ensure that uh, individuals who have uh, lost the ability to make their own medical decisions or have not yet reached the age at which they're able to do so are protected in these processes? And what are the ethical considerations we need to consider? Yeah, I, I, I think you laid that out so well, Lindsay, and I, I feel like we we can raise more ethical uh, questions that we can maybe solve immediately, right? It's a brave new world. Um, but I think, you know, one one of the things that, that it seems like there's, you know, pretty, well, I wouldn't say consensus, um, there's, there's opinions on all sides, but I think in terms of um, incorporating genetic testing into newborn screening, I think a lot of us feel like it should be an opt-in. Um, program at this point. And then I do think that having a process by which people can remove their data easily um, and have the opportunity to do that in a public health program is going to be really important. Also, a lot of transparency um, is going to be important from our public health labs, um, just making sure that, um, you know, as, as this field progresses and advances, that public health programs are being very transparent and very, uh, very um, receptive to these conversations. And also, I just think uh, making sure that we're not dismissive to people's very genuine concerns, right? I think it's it's important that we don't, you know, especially those of us who who live on the other side, right? So, so those of us who have lived through a journey where we've had a child um, diagnosed and identified, it can be easy to be dismissive of the concerns of the general public about this data collection. So I think also just truly listening to one another and not being dismissive of concerns and assuming that people are just overreacting or, you know, so, so just being, being really dialogue, having a lot of dialogue. And I would uh, add, to, to, oh, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, just to jump in on the concept of uh, adults who have been diagnosed with cognitive uh, deficiency which almost certainly is in the context of a neurodegenerative disease that is not getting better. Um, you know, already a uh, huge um, a huge hurdle in in a, a person's life has been crossed when you're when we're when there's an acceptance that they cannot give consent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they have been declared like. Um, legally non, 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 non participatory person. 
and they they were presumably under the guardianship of somebody else. And so um, w once that has been accepted, um, it, it seems it seems it's past the point where you should where where it makes sense to be considering these things because you have already taken that person away from their own um, uh, legal decision making capa uh, capabilities. So of course their uh, guardian is the person who's now in charge of them, and um, you know that that's who's who's looking at their interests. So um, just just to jump on that one. <laughs> I appreciate that. I was hoping you would. And I'm going to hop back to a second to the child perspective, because I think there's a lot of parents out there who will do anything and everything for their kids, and they may not agree as they get older. So really considering options and what age do we let children remove themselves from something like this? And do they have access to that information themselves when they get to a certain age? say they're having medical conditions where some of these things might be helpful. So really looking at from that kid's perspective, what happens after the parents have already consented. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just maybe add too, I think, you, you know, even hearing these responses, you, you know, you can see the benefit of genetic counseling over time. You know, I think one of the things that that I will often see or we'll see in the community is, is that genetic counseling is only recommended or patients are only referred for access to testing or because a test was done. And it was talking about the implications of that one test. But in reality, right, it can be a lifelong process. And the questions you may have with a genetic counselor right upon that diagnosis, you might just be trying to like find your way. This is a new diagnosis. You're not ready to talk about the implications for the rest of the family, or your child is little. You don't know what you might need to talk about once they're in adolescence. So I guess I would just say a plug of like, there's not one right time um, to see a genetic counselor that can change over time. And it can also be a family process, right? Because I think Christine, like you mentioned, you know, I can remember when I was seeing and counseling patients and dad is going to have a different perspective on the value that this test may take versus mom versus when this kiddo is older. And so that is something, um, you know, is nice to see over time um, is that you can always come back and see a genetic counselor because your questions may change over time. And and I, I will say that the plug is it's, it, there's the benefit of telemedicine there, right? Because you can get multiple people on the phone at the same time and they can have that conversation versus if you're having to travel a distance. That's been something nice we've been able to see with our company is the ability for other family members to engage in the process. Fantastic. Yeah, Molly, I love kind of to call out, uh, I think people think of newborn screening as just at that point of birth, but you're right, you know, strong mm -hmm. follow-up care programs in states and this the, the, the precision medicine and all of this makes that even so much more important that states not only screen for these children, but they really strengthen their follow-up care programs. Because you're right, it's just the beginning of the journey and we don't want to lose kids to follow-up. We don't want to um, have exactly those, you know, those decisions. We don't, we don't want them to be making these really big decisions alone. Mm -hmm. Right. When we think about all the different stakeholders that play, that are at play here. So you have the individuals being tested. You may have family members. Um, you have the state when it's a newborn screening program or a population initiative or uh, an academic or a research institution. Um, one of the questions that came up during our prep calls was, storing genetic information is an expensive endeavor and how how should we or how might we approach the finances of that the ethics of that who is responsible for the storage and the safekeeping of that information um i'd love to do a quick round of replies on that one look i can i say from the patient side of it i did not realize how much data you would gather on yourselves until I started to. And I think for a lot of patients, the cost of storage is definitely going to be an issue. So how we kind of work something where, you know, someone else holds the storage, but a patient still has that access to the data is, is a question that I think we should talk about, you know. 
Yeah, I'll say I, I don't have a right answer for this, but maybe I'll just recognize being right a healthcare provider and, and, and coming from healthcare organization, we recognize how disjointed the system is right now. I think even just seeing how patients come in, right, to see genetics, right? They they may have said, I've had testing before. I think it was at this lab, or maybe it was when I was at this institution. I've now changed. There's a different EHR. I don't have access to all that. So recognizing that there is not a great system to kind of track all of this. And I think, you know, that the genetics profession recognizes that. Um, and so I think there's been a big focus on how do we empower the patient as much as possible and give them the information, right? We, we may not always be able to rely on the fact that even if their test result is embedded in the EHR as a PDF and they have all of these records of the providers that they've seen, um, making sure the patient has what they need to get the next steps. Um, so I'll say from our company, you know, we always, you know, send back um, a note back to the patient as well. We encourage them to have a copy of their genetic test reports, multiple if needed, because we recognize that the system in place is not, not always built for success, right? And we, we as providers have to kind of function within that. So that was a little bit of a non-answer, but... <laughs> No, I, I would agree with you that, you know, the issue of data harmonization is so, uh, you, you kind of have to solve for that <laughs> to talk about how, how we store this data because it's such a fragmented, uh, sort of a fragmented system. So, so how, do we, how do we do some data har harmonization so that that data um, can, can be, um, you know, stored collectively and comprehensively? And I agree with you, Molly, I, I don't have a, a great answer. <laughs> I think that whatever solution we find does have to strike that balance between, um, you know, the, the patient having the ownership, but also it being stored responsibly um, and, and safely. And so there's going to be all of these sort of um, weights that we have to consider when, when we talk about this data storage. Uh, and just to, to raise up that, you know, there's uh, a different flavor of this for people in clear um, inherited uh, disease families where there's no current mutation found. Um, the ability to have generational knowledge on the genetics of prior generations that had the disease allows for screening for new, new findings or, or to find new uh, genes implicated in these uh, diseases. And um, it was very troubling on our prep call, Lindsay, to hear how that, I think it came up that there's not people really in that space holding genetic uh, material for future testing anymore. And um, yeah, that's that's a, something that needs to be worked out. A lot of the labs will hold it for a set number of, of years or time, um, but but I, to my knowledge, and maybe someone else knows another answer, there isn't a single entity that's holding it for the generations that you're speaking about. Um, okay, we are at time. So very quickly, if you could give one a one sentence key takeaway that you hope listeners bring away from this discussion. Um, I'm just going to go in order of who's on my screen. So my apologies ahead of time uh, for who goes first, but Erica, you are first on my screen. Um, so your final thought, please. Yeah, so I think what I want people to come away from is um, just the enormity of the progress that we have made in genetics over the last decade. It has been absolutely breathtaking. We're in a whole new world. We have opportunity to address diseases that were out of the reach of medicine even 10, 15 years ago. So it's going to take a lot of courage. It's going to take a lot of good thinking, a lot of responsibility. But I want everybody to walk away excited about the future. Great. Christine. Oh, gosh. I would say that the thing I want people to come away from is, is really just the potential we have in using genomic sequencing, especially at birth, to build up these databases, to look at more preventative measures when we're looking at disease and to answer some of those unanswered questions that we all have. Thank you. Molly. Yeah, I will, I will say, I will emphasize that genetic counseling is a life long process. It's just not one moment in time. And so I think I say that for patients to say, it's okay to feel like you didn't maybe get all your questions answered, or you still have questions to come back. 
And it's also okay for providers to say, you know, instead of checking that box to say, have you seen a genetic counselor check? You don't need to see them again. Really think about asking your patients questions of, would you like to, maybe these are questions you might have. Do you think it might be beneficial? Um, and then that, you know, to listen to patients. I, I think you've seen that thread throughout, but I can think about, you know, how important it is to really kind of listen to patients, listen to the community and help um, them really guide the direction of kind of conversations and discussions. Fantastic. And Jean? Um, I just hope that we can all uh, move uh, when we're thinking about the policy and genetics, that we can move away from a protection from genetics and towards empowering people to use genetics for precision medicine. I can think of no better way to end this conversation. So yes, empowerment to use your own health information for your own medical decisions is is where we're all trying to head, I think. So thank you all so much for being leaders and making that happen. I have thoroughly enjoyed the conversation today. I wish we had like four more hours to keep going, maybe one day. Um, thank you again. And we are appreciative of everyone who takes time to listen in. If you have questions, please do send them our way. We'd be happy to answer them uh, by email. And uh, if you wanna get in touch with any of the speakers today, please feel free to send me a note. Thank you and have a great day.